everyone in. Is everyone ready? All good? Okay. All right. Um, good day, everyone. Welcome to the UTI speaker series. Uh, we're very excited to have you here today. And before I introduce today's talk, I would like to give a brief overview of the what we do at the UTI speaker series, uh, because we expect to have quite a few new audience members here. For those who are new, um, what we do at the UTI lab is that we are a youth led nonprofit organization dedicated to increasing students to expert connections, AI literacy, and making high school students future ready. Uh, and this webinar is a part of our monthly speaker series. To raise awareness for AI among all communities, uh, we invite experts from academia and industry to share their knowledge and discovery in specific areas of AI. Unlike other technical talks, these talks will be tailored to people without much background in AI. Uh, therefore, uh, they will be fun and easy to listen to and follow, and we hope that by uh, attending our talks regularly, our audience will gain a solid uh, knowledge of AI. So, yes, please help spread the word, word uh, about our speaker series uh, and Youth AI. Uh, we thank you for your support of this education and community service initiative. Uh, please also consider visiting our website at uh, youthai.org, uh, where you can sign up and receive announcements for our upcoming events, as well as uh, supplementary resource AI-related resources. And uh, finally, for those who miss our talks or do not have the time to uh, come live to these talks, we do have uh, plans to publish the webinar summary uh, after the talk, a few days after the talk. So we posted, uh, until now we've hosted 18 of these fantastic talks uh, since we have kicked off the UCI speaker series uh, almost two years ago, uh, where we have covered important topics and areas such as uh, efficient AI, graphics AI, cognitive AI, finance AI, as well as uh, various different implications of AI. Our speakers are held in high regard in their respective fields, whether it be academia or industry. Uh, we have speakers from big players in the industry, such as Facebook or Meta, Microsoft, and speakers from top AI universities, such as Carnegie Mellon, MIT, UC Berkeley, and Stanford. Uh, replays of these talks are mostly available on our YouTube channel, uh, just Youth AI Lab, uh, with the exception of a few talks which are not available on YouTube due to the speaker's company policy. In the last Youth AI talk, uh, Dr. Grady, a successful AI researcher and entrepreneur, spoke on the topic of bringing AI to healthcare, where he discussed the process of creating and marketing AI technologies uh, in the healthcare industry. Uh, you are encouraged to go ahead and watch that replay, uh, which is available on our YouTube channel if uh, you have not yet. Unfortunately, the date and speaker for our next October talk is not yet determined. However, we're very happy to announce the launch of our Youth AI Community Discord, where you can keep up to date with all upcoming Youth AI events, ranging from talks with experts from academia and industry to competitions and hackathons. And it's also just a great place to connect with peers who share your curiosities and passions. And it's also a good place to directly ask questions to our capable team of mentors and to get announcements on the exciting opportunities we have in store for our members. So right now, I think this is our first time pushing out this community Discord server. So we definitely invite you all to hop on um, and uh, join our community there. And so it will be pasted in the chat below. Um, so feel free to just uh, hop on. Here's the Discord link. And so, yeah, definitely, if you want to keep up to date on our next upcoming talk, which is yet to be scheduled, this is a good place to do it. And before introducing Dr. Pinot, I'd like to briefly go over the logistics of this talk. Um, since we have an audience watching from our YouTube live stream, as well as on Zoom, we'll be doing Q&A through a platform called Slido. And so either go to the URL that will be put in the chat 
or you can go to Slido and enter event code 12359. And so feel free to submit questions throughout the talk, um, but we'll only be answering questions in a Q&A session at the very end of Dr. Pinot's talk. So be sure to stick around for that. Um, and let me also paste the link in the chat for everyone. So now let me introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Pinot. Dr. Pinot is an associate professor and William Dawson scholar at the School of Computer Science at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. And she also leads Meta, Facebook's uh, fundamental AI research lab. She received a master's and PhD in robotics from Carnegie Mellon University. In addition to being the past president of the International Machine Learning Society, she serves on the editorial board of Journal of Machine Learning Research. Um, she's a re recipient of many different awards uh, for her scholarship and as well as her achievements within the field. Her research focuses on complex problems in robotics, healthcare, games, conversational agents, along with generating new medical treatment strategies. Her team has used deep learning to detect seizures and AI technology to analyze medical scans. Dr. Pernod is also an entrepreneur. She founded two startups that develop robotic assistance for the elderly, the Smart Wheeler Initiative and the NurseBot platform. Smart Wheeler is a multi-model wheelchair that combines artificial intelligence and robotics. So today our brilliant speaker, Dr. Pernod, will focus on discussing the main areas of AI research, computer vision, dialogue, touch, interaction and generative models, self-supervised learning that will influence the development of the metaverse and what this opens in terms of applications. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Pinot. Thank gonna... you so much. It's a I'll pleasure stop. to be here. Definitely, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, I stopped screen sharing now, so you should be able to um, screen share your slides. Everyone can see the first slide. Yes, looks good. Awesome. We'll get going. Uh, it, it's really it's great to be here. Um, I really love uh, sharing what's going on in AI with a really wide variety of people. And so it's really an honor, privilege to be here today and share some of the work that we've been doing, in particular, a lot of the work that I'm excited about seeing coming up the pipeline. Um, we'll have lots of time for questions at the end, so don't hesitate to drop them in the Slido. Um, and I, I guess I will try to keep this uh, accessible and fun as promised by Andrew in the introduction. Because uh, many people have perhaps not uh, been here before, I wanted to make sure that we start a little bit from the beginning. Woo! Is that uh, typical? We'll try to maybe ah. take away some Oops. of the writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if we can take away some of the the ability for folks <laughs> that here let me um i'll let you fiddle with that i'll i'll start from the beginning the the field of ai has really been around for for several decades now starting from the mid 50s or so and do you want me to unshare and reshare is that easier um it should be all right let me see I'll just do a quick reshare. Okay. And so through this, through this time, the several decades of AI, there's really been several phases of development of the technology. And I'm gonna focus on the most recent phase that is really all around machine learning. So up to about the 1990s, really a lot of people thought the best way to crack AI, meaning to build intelligent systems, such as those to play chess, um, was really based on instructing the machine how to solve problems. So we would give very precise instructions in terms of rules of the game and let the system search through a very wide space of solution. Coming around the 1990s, you know, these are techniques that had been um, explored in research labs for many, many years, but really we didn't have good results of how to make it work. And when it came around that time when we had large enough data sets, the machine learning techniques really started to be you know, more effective for solving problems. 
in particular problems where it's difficult to write the rules of the game. So I'm showing a brief example on the right of uh, scans. These are actually brain scans taken. The task here is to take that scanning image from different perspectives and try to find in a 3D space the location of a tumor in a brain. And so as you can imagine, you know, if you try to write down the rules of how to do that, it's very, very difficult to be prescriptive about it. And even the way that humans learn about it, they may learn about some characteristics of tumors, but then a lot of the training is actually through examples and through teaching that way. And so the machine learning techniques that started to dominate the field of AI are really based on this strategy. And let me spend just a little bit of time digging into what we mean by learning in this case. It's a class of methods that's called supervised learning. And so in supervised learning, really what you do is show the machine several examples of a particular topic. And in this case, I think we have uh here, let's uh, try this. Go to, uh, so do you see the share screen tab at the very top of your screen? Yeah. So click uh, more. You should be yeah. able to disable annotations from there. There you go. Okay. okay. <laughs> I hope this will flow smoothly. Thank you. Um, and so in supervised learning, really, we try to to show several examples and to pair those examples with a concept. So in this case, on the top left, I'm showing several examples of an abacus and the machine through seeing lots of examples can learn some general properties of these abacus. In particular, learning to generalize to new pictures of the same type of object. So really once it's seen several examples through training and given the concept by a human who labeled the concept, then it can actually look at new images such as the one in the bottom and answer the question, which of these objects is an abacus? And so this is really this notion of supervised learning, which from the 1990s or so until a few years ago has been the predominant way that we train machines to solve all sorts of tasks. And one of the main reasons why we've seen such a rise in AI. In terms of the technique that goes on under the hood in many of our computers, the idea is that we present large amount of data, so millions of these examples. We train a function to analyze all the pieces of the information. Most of the time, these functions are neural networks. We'll talk about it in a second. And from that, the machine is trained to make a prediction. And the more examples of objects it's seen and the bigger its function, the better it's able to do a prediction. And for those who may not be familiar with what I mean by a function here, you can think of a function as being like a little line of code. And so the more lines of code that you add, the function gets more and more complex. Or for those of you who've actually done some work, for example, on linear regression, you maybe have uh, tried to optimize a function for data. This is the type of function that we have here, but much more complex um, in particular with nonlinear components in it. And so really modern AI is all about building a prediction machine. And the dominant way that we build these prediction machines nowadays is through neural networks. And so neural networks that we build in our computers are actually inspired by the bio biological neural networks. In the biology, when you have a neuron, that neuron actually receives information from other neurons and it computes, there's a small chemical reaction that happens inside the neuron. It computes some information essentially and decides whether to send off an impulse. And when it sends off an impulse, that message is essentially at a chemical level being sent to other neurons. And so the power of the human brain is achieved when you link several millions of these neurons together to compute very complicated functions. When we do the same in our machines, we have a small notion of, I mentioned this function, well, each little piece of the function is computed essentially in an artificial neuron that takes in information from other neurons, it computes its little function, and then it sends out its message, which is essentially the result of a mathematical equation. And when you put in thousands or millions or even billions of these neurons together, you're able to learn more and more complex concepts and many concepts at the same time. So throughout the talk, I won't get as much into some of these sort of mathematical details, but that's something to keep in mind when I talk about how the machine learned. This is a little quickly uh, the picture of how that machine is a train. When we talk about learning, what happens, we're not actually creating the neurons. The neurons are sort of given up front. 
what we do when we train is actually decide what information to send along each of the connections. So all of the connections over here have a weight on that. And depending on what function you compute, you can change that weight. So when we're training them, we change the weight so that the machine sends the right signals to the right neurons so that at the end, you can really get the right prediction. Remember that these AI systems are really these prediction machines. And so let me give you a taste of what happens when you train one of these systems with millions of neurons observing really large amounts of images. Around 2012 is really one year where we saw the ability for these networks to get really good results with images. And so at that time, the AI system would take one image and it would associate one or two concepts. So the image like the one I'm showing here, the system was able to detect that this image contained people and it contained some trees. Now that's a pretty good summary of the image, but it's also lacking a lot of the detail that if you had someone you know, give a caption to this image, probably your caption would be more detailed than this. Quickly, within a few years, we really started having more precise information about our images. So 2015, new system comes out, more neurons, larger information, more complicated context. This one can not only predict the object, it can actually put a bounding box around each of these objects. So it realized there's not just one person, there's actually, in this case, six people in this image, each of which can be labeled. Two years later, even larger network, even more images to train it. We have a technique that actually can pick out the outline of the object, not with a box, which is pretty coarse, but sort of at the pixel level, it can determine what the pixels are defining and what object they belong to. Now, if you look closely, this image is pretty good at doing it from the objects in the foreground of the image. It doesn't give us any information about the background of the image. And so you had to wait a couple more years for that. 2019, we have a technique that actually gives us what we call full semantic labeling of the scene. So it analyzes all of the image and it's able to annotate the precise concept that is present in each part of the image, the front, the back, it handles occlusions and it's able to do a full characterization of the image and do that with a really wide set of images. I'm showing these examples really to give you a sense of how fast the progression is happening and really how much more details the predictions are getting towards having image analysis systems that are really quite complete and rich. What happens when you go from you know, what we were able to do in 2012 to what we can now do in 2019, and things have improved a little bit since then, but I'll tell you about you know, where we've been working more since then. But what happens from you know, 2012, 2019, span of seven years, you have a system that at the beginning can only give you one or two concepts. This is totally unusable for real world applications such as self-driving cars, such as at the top right, you know, the smart wheeler system that we built a few years ago. You'll fast forward to the system we have in 2019. It's actually giving us much more information to the point that you can think of having one of these systems inside a vehicle where it can pick out pedestrians, other vehicles, stop signs, bicycles, and so on and so forth. And so really less than a decade span, and we're completely changing the possibilities in terms of downstream applications of what we can do with this technology. Now, this is possible through a few things. One of them I've discussed is, you know, having these neural network and having many, many millions of neurons in these neural networks. The other thing that's important to learn more and more complicated concept is to have more and more data. And so I'm showing here an exponential graph that gives you a sense of what's the scale of the data that is being produced. This is an estimate of the data produced by humans. This isn't sort of passive data. This is data that we produce as a society and projection to 2025. Um, I, I'll leave it to you to look up what is a zettabyte um, in case you don't know, but it's a very, very large number. And this is really the quantity that we're looking. It's bigger than a gigabyte, bigger than a petabyte, bigger than a terabyte. Um, and and it really captures the scale of the data that we are generating. And so in a sense, the promise of artificial intelligence is to take all of this data through our algorithms and turn it into prediction machines, which can bring value, financial value, social value as well. Beyond the size of the network, the size of the data, 
The third ingredient, which I haven't mentioned yet, is the size of the compute. And so to train these very large models on this very large data, you actually need very large compute servers. And so this is clusters of GPUs, which are training these models. This curve looks like a linear curve. It doesn't look like an exponential, but actually those of you who are looking carefully probably already know this that on the Y axis, I have an exponential scale going on that Y axis. So it's actually also an exponential curve. And this is giving you each of the point correspond to a different AI model that was released between 2012 and 2019. AlexNet over here is the first one. That's the 20 model I showed you. The ResNet is one of the models that was the intermediate one. And so you get a bit of a sense of how big the models are getting. And now by 21, uh, 22, we're in terms of much bigger models uh, that that trend is continuing to date. So these are the ingredients we have you know, very large networks, lots of data, lots of compute, and the ability to learn very rich concepts. Now, most of these techniques that I've described are trained on what I called supervised learning that I explained briefly at the beginning. The notion of supervised learning is actually to train typically one type of data for one concept. And so you take images, for example, and you can get images that you can train for image caption, or you can train them for object recognition, but each of these models is trained separately and the humans need to provide the concept for each of these. On the one hand, it gives you models that are very smart and very robust. On the other hand, it means if your set of concept changes, then you need to provide new labels and retrain the system from scratch. And so it's not so useful to train across several different tasks. Where we're really moving towards in terms of our research these days is towards building unified models. And so the notion of a unified model is actually one where you could take on all sorts of data together, text data, image data, speech, and so on, put it all in one of these very, very large models, and from that, with just a little bit of adaptation, make predictions across a wide set of tasks. And so this is a bit of a, you know, a vision or a dream right now. We can't really build these unified models quite yet, but this is what we're working towards. I would say the supervised learning is really well established, well understood. The notion of building these unified models is a really active area of research across industry and university labs right now. If you look carefully, actually, the technique we're using is a technique called self-supervised learning. It's a little bit different from supervised learning. And this is really the key to building a unified model, which then with a little bit of adaptation can be used with many, many different tasks and concepts. So let me tell you a bit about how self-supervised learning is working. In self-supervised learning, you get the image, but no one tells you what the concept is. So you're shown an image such as the one on the left, but no one's going to tell you that this is people and trees. No one's going to you know, label all the pixels of your image. So you're not able to learn this. What we will do to train the system is we're going to hide part of the image. And the goal of the learning is to reconstruct the parts that are hidden. And so what the AI system learns isn't specific concept, it's the representation itself, the nature of the data. And so you might wonder how that works. You know, If you're not seeing a piece of the image, how could you possibly know what's there? But in fact, because it's trained on millions of images, it can actually generalize from other images and get a sense of what would be a plausible way to fill in the image, given all the other images it's seen and that structure. And so I'm showing you here a quick little demo of that type of reconstruction happening. It's surprising how well it reconstructs, even if there's 50, 75, 80% of the image that's blocked at the beginning. Some of these you're seeing very little of the image from the beginning. And through the training, it gets better and better at reconstructing all the details of the image. If you hide too much of it, you're not guaranteed to reconstruct exactly the same initial image, 
but typically you do reconstruct a very plausible image, one that looks very natural. And so this is the idea of self-supervised learning. Right now I'm showing it to you just with images, but we can play the exact same trick, whether it's text. So I give you a paragraph, I hide part of the paragraph, I give you the other part and you have to predict either the words, the sentences or the part of the paragraph that's missing. We can do the same thing with sound. I can play you some music, cut out the music at a particular point and ask the algorithm to predict the rest of the song. And so this technique of self-supervised learning is interesting because it works very similar across all of these modalities. And it's the best hope we have right now of being able to build one of these unified models. Now, let me show you how we've done in terms of performance. You know, over the last few years in red, I have the techniques that are based on supervised learning techniques. So in this case, you have the concept annotation from the human. On blue, I have the progression of these self-supervised learning methods. So around 2021, 2022, the self-supervised learning methods, even though they don't get any annotation for humans, are almost catching up in terms of their ability to learn concept. In this case, it's really the top one accuracy. So it's just how accurate can you be across a thousand different types of objects on ImageNet, which is a, a benchmark data set. And so it's quite promising to see this. Our job isn't done, I would say. There's still some work to do, but I think these methods are really quite promising. Um, let me tell you a little bit of how we use these methods over the last couple of years. Um, as we were struggling with uh, COVID across the globe, we had the opportunity to partner with researchers at uh, several hospitals, both in Montreal as well as in New York, who provided us data from COVID patients, in particular uh, x-rays of the chest of COVID patients that had been hospitalized. And the task was to predict how the patients would fare, whether they would need to be intubated, whether they would need to be moved to the ICU, or in some cases, whether the patient would die from the disease. And so from that data set in the early days, we didn't have a lot of COVID patient data, at least not a lot by the standards of machine learning algorithms. Of course, much too much in terms of uh, what we wish for society, but to train the algorithm, it was relatively little. And so we did what the doctors were doing, which is to look at x-rays of chest of other respiratory diseases, try to pick out the symptoms of the disease. And so the self-supervision, we were able to pre-train our algorithm with large amount of chest x-rays from other diseases, respiratory diseases, of course, and train it with self-supervised learning until it had a very good representation. After that, we presented the system with a, just a little bit of COVID data where we gave it the label for the different outcomes of the patients on that much smaller amount of data, just on the order of a few hundred patients in this case. And we were able to predict with relatively high accuracy, the outcome of patients over 24, 48 hours, 72 hours, 96 hours, trying to see who would get worse and who would get better. And the goal is really to improve the treatment for these patients, as well as decide at that time, you know, decide how we were going to use our very limited hospital resources. So it's interesting to see in this case how, you know, some of the work that we've been doing with uh, other types of images, we were able to apply with medical images. Again, you know, if you think of working towards these unified model that can use all this data, this was quite an interesting case. We were really fortunate to have that partnership with the hospitals to get that project done over the last couple of years. Stepping out of that a little bit, and I will get to talking about the metaverse. I promised I would uh, get to that, but I, I wanted to set the stage for where, where we are now to give you a better appreciation of where we're going in terms of the metaverse. So we're at this particular time point where we had actually great results with AI, with certain types of data, the potential to train different systems, autonomous systems for society is actually increasing. At the bottom here, these are US numbers, but at the bottom here, you have sort of a predicted rise in terms of the prevalence of uh, service robots availability. At the top, again, this is US data. I apologize for not <laughs> being able to capture all of the all the countries where some of you may be joining us from, but at least for the US, we see after several years of climbing uh, labor force, so number of people who are working at this time, 
a sharp decline over the last uh, decade or so. And so there's really an opportunity to use more autonomous systems to really um, palliate that gap in terms of the workforce. And so on the one hand, you know, this notion of building autonomous systems for uh, society, this notion of functional AI is a big area of research and there's a huge potential, lots of interesting startups and applications. On the other hand, there's several people in the community who are really much more focused on a notion of building what we call AGI, so artificial general intelligence essentially artificial intelligence that would match human intelligence across a really wide set of tasks. And in parallel with this, there's a third uh, goal and contingent of people that are really working on responsible AI. And so the idea to build AI systems that actually are behaving in a way that is positive for individuals and for society. These three things are not mutually exclusive. So it's possible to work on systems for functional AI to solve a particular problem in society today, that the work you'll do for functional AI will advance our progression towards general AI, and the work should be done with principles of responsible AI. So I just wanna highlight sort of these three branches, but I wanna be very clear, I don't see these as necessarily being incompatible. Actually, I think there's much to learn between each of them. Now, digging in a little bit on where does the metaverse fit into all of that. Um, I, I work for a company that is now called Meta, used to be called Facebook, uh, but now has moved to Meta really on the premise that the metaverse was gonna be such a profound transformational technology that it was worth pivoting the mission of the company as well as several of the people who work there to develop this concept. So it's a little bit hard for some people to grasp what it means to be, what is this supposed to be? I think one of the ways that people have described it in sort of a, to, to give the most you know, um, illustrative way is as the next iteration, the next generation of the internet. Let me try to give you a more detailed definition that I think highlights several of the properties of what we're trying to build here. The idea is to have a massively scaled and interoperable network. And so in this case, massively scaled means that network is extending at the size of the planet, reaching everyone who's connected to a network. Interoperable means that you are able to access that network through different devices, that you have some consistency in terms of the protocols, and that different software, different hardware can all plug into that network. That network, if it succeeds, should be able to render in real time 3D virtual worlds. So think about that. what happens in VR with full 3D rendering. So I assume most of you are familiar with sort of 2D metaverse experience like Roblox or Minecraft, Fortnite, these kinds of experience. But think of that rendered in real time in 3D. Experience synchronously, so at the same time and persistently by an unlimited number of users. So these two concepts are actually important, right? If you're in several different worlds at the same time, then the notion of what you own in the virtual world, who you are, your identity, the objects that you interact with have to be updated synchronously across all these worlds. And the information has to be persistent. So if you decide to change something about your identity in one world, you hope that that carries in the other world. And so this notion of individual presence and continuity is really important to that. And so with that, you know, that opens up so many different new questions for AI. I'll touch on a few of these today, but, um, <laughs> you know, one of the reasons I'm really excited to, to, share, to share this with you today is because I think in many ways, the, the metaverse is going to be built by your generation much more than by my generation. I am here planting the seeds of what this may be, but it will be up to you to really take this in your hands and to define what kind of technology this is and what kind of society we build inside of this. And so with that caveat, you know, I think there's all sorts of experiences that are being imagined, mixing human avatars with much more um, creative avatars 
Some people are thinking of using this for work. So instead of meeting on Zoom, we would actually all put on our virtual reality headsets and we'd be meeting in this 3D space. I have to say during the pandemic, I had a, some meetings that were actually in Horizon Worlds rather than on Zoom, which gave a very different experience. Um, sound is in 3D, your vision is in 3D, people move around. It's actually quite a different experience. There's also a lot of people who are seeing this technology's potential in terms of creating. So whether it's creating new types of art, whether it's creating new types of music, attending sporting events, attending concerts in a way that you couldn't do it um, uh, otherwise or would require a lot of travel. And so really there's a many, many different opportunities. Sometimes people ask me like, what is the sort of the, the, the killer app for this? And I think it's much too narrow of a question, really. I think each of us individually have to decide what is the experience that we want to have in this new space. Similarly to right now, each of us you know, uses very different applications, um, modes of communications on the internet. And, and that's okay that there's such a wide set of choices is really part of the appeal. So that will also, I expect, happen with the metaverse. Um, when we think about AI and what type of technology to develop, uh, it's really the immersive side of the metaverse that appeals to me. So the sense that when you're on the internet, you know, the examples I showed you with images, it's all about 2D images, it's out about um, uh, sound, um, but really when you move to the metaverse, you have a much richer experience, you have to rethink what does sight looks like, what does sound look like? It opens up the door to touch and smell and taste, all sorts of new sensors that you can include in the experience. Some of them are really just beginning. Some of them are more advanced than others. The one where I'll spend a little bit more time today is actually touch, because I feel that both sight and sound, you know, what we've done in the internet will transfer and move to 3D, but we have a better sense of how it's going. Smell and taste, are really much further out in the future. But touch, we're really at a pivotal moment of starting to understand touch and having building sensors for it. So let me tell you a little bit about what's going on. What I'm showing you here is a new sensor, that blue glove is a new sensor called Reskin that's built in collaboration with researchers at Meta's AI Research Lab and researchers at CMU. Inside of that glove, there's all these magnetic sensors and so as you manipulate a surface, the magnetic sensors read the force that's being applied and from that can send that information to a neural network over time. It's a completely new sensor. It does use self-supervised learning to calibrate and to be able to use it in all sorts of different experiences. And so in a sense, we're starting to build the models, but for this, before we were able to even build the neural net model, we had to get the data. And so we start from really the beginning, in this case, building this new sensor. Um, it's not the only one that we're building. Uh, this one is called digits. It's actually more fingers. And so each of these fingers inside of it has essentially a visual sensor that captures a deflection of several digit, several different points in the finger. So you can think of this as the pixels of touch, just like in your camera, you have pixels, but in this case, it's the pixels of touch. It's actually able to finely manipulate some objects. Here we're seeing a little glass bead between the different fingers. Again, really starting from the beginning, developing the right sensors to get the data. And now we're gonna to move to training AI models, incorporating that into digital experiences. And so it's a really exciting time to be thinking about this technology. It's completely new data. If we want the metaverse to appeal to a large number of people, it's not just about the senses. We also have to build models that are actually inclusive of several populations across the globe. And so one of the other projects we've been working on in the last couple of years is a project, No Language Left Behind. And the idea of this is to build a machine translation system that works across 200 different languages. So compared to other translation systems that worked on 
a dozen or 30 or 60 languages. This one includes many, many more languages. We're still not done. There are many languages we don't capture yet, but we've released results earlier this year showing the ability to translate between all these 200 languages. The other thing that's quite interesting here is in the past, whenever we wanted to translate between two languages, let's say French and Korean, we always had to go through English as an intermediate language because there's so much of the data on the web that's available in English. So our system would go from French to English and then from English to Korean, which is a reasonable way to do it, but it means that every piece of knowledge, every expression is grounded in the English language, which may or not be desirable. Um, in fact, you have a much richer translation when you allow all the different pairs to interact directly together. So this system, No Language Left Behind, actually looks at doing this without necessarily having to go through English as an intermediate language. Of course, there's some challenges. There's several of these languages for which we don't have a lot of data. And, and so we have to keep on building up our ability to do high quality recognition across all of these. Um, I'm really excited to, to see that over the last few years, if we look at these systems that are based on sort of a bilingual model that I mentioned before, right? The system that goes from French to English and then English to Korean, whereas they were much better in terms of performance. Here on the left side, I have the blue score, which is essentially a measure of how well the translation, the translation quality of the system. So for many years, the bilingual system were much better, but starting around 2021, we're seeing the rise of these multilingual models and seeing that the, multi, the, the, language, the models that build across all languages at once are actually starting to dominate, which is really quite exciting. Again, lots of work to be done. All of this is actually for written languages. We know that many languages don't have a written script. They're purely oral language. So one of the big challenges coming ahead is really how do we do this, not just for written translation, but actually for spoken languages as well. Beyond, I've talked about touch. I've talked about language. The other thing I want to talk about is um, generating content. So when we project ourselves in the metaverse, I, I give you a little taste of it with these very creative avatars. But there's really a possibility to create new people, places, things, all of this content that can be rendered. We talked about, you know, real time rendering in 3D. This is quite challenging. If you think to give you an analogy, you know, if I ask you um, to identify each of the images in this, I'm pretty sure it's easy for you to identify each of these, right? A coffee cup, a mushroom, and so on and so forth. If I was to ask you to draw each of these objects, I ask you to draw a mushroom, I ask you to draw a coffee cup, you know, except for those of you who may have very good artistic talent, for many of us, it's very easy to recognize. It's much, much harder to generate the image. Remarkably, AI systems are much like that. It's much easier for them to recognize than it is to generate data. And so in the last five years or so, that has been really one of the grand challenges of AI, the ability to generate this data. What I'm showing you here on the left is these are the training images. So those are when we fed our system. On the right, these are samples from the model. So we prompted the system and asked it to generate all of these images. So you see that actually, sometimes if you look closely, you see some artifacts, things that don't look quite right, but overall, it's not bad. And this is from 2017. There's been actually a lot of improvement in this technology. Some of you may have heard of the DALI model, which came out early this year, really some terrific progress. One of the things that you see from 2015 to 2020 is um, both the complexity of the, the, the directions. In this case, the system gets a sentence that describes what you want to see in the image. The complexity of the sentences are getting more and more and the resolution of the image is getting much better. So 2020, you see, this doesn't look quite right. There's some visual artifacts sort of, overall it looks okay, but the visual artifacts aren't great. But 2022, really impressive that, you know, it's such a bizarre concept. I don't think the system was trained on anything that looks like this, and yet it's able to put together all the pieces of the instructions. Um, and so it's exciting to see this is still 2D, it's not 3D yet, 
but it gives you a taste again of, you know, what are the challenges, how fast this is progressing as well. Um, one of the challenges to move into the metaverse is going to be able to do this with 3D objects. It's tricky because we don't have nearly as much data for 3D objects. So if you think of 2D images, we can grab large amounts of data for the web. For 3D object, they have to be um, in a particular condition to be uh, acquired. Essentially, you either need you know, a, a whole rig with several cameras to acquire all the different points of views, or at least a few different uh, 2D points of views, and then you fill out the rest with uh, training from other images. But it's a bit tricky. We have much less data for three D objects, and so you know we're going to have to we're going to have to get uh, get working uh, before we can have generations of these assets for the metaverse. In the last uh, few minutes, and we'll open it up to questions soon. I just want to you know step back a little bit from sort of the 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 bigger vision and and acknowledge that these are, algorithms are still making a lot of mistakes. In this case, we provided an image and asked for the description. You're seeing some of the you know, mistakes that the algorithms are making. It's quite common. It's always good when you're seeing results from an AI system to not just look at the really good results, but ask, you know, what does it get wrong to really understand this? A lot of the times the performance drops with the availability of data. So whether it's languages, whether it's faces or places, when we have less representation for certain types of concepts or certain people, we have much less good prediction accuracy on this. This can lead to algorithmic bias, as we've seen in some cases where facial recognition systems are not nearly as good with people of color rather than um, white people because of the distribution of the data. It leads to much more errors in some languages for which we have much less data than other languages. So I think it's good to be aware of these limitations of these systems and to be as transparent as possible when building those systems about those limitations. For me, it's important to really embrace both aspects when we build these systems, the scientific responsibility. And for those of us who are trained in engineering or in science, you know, the notions on the left are really things that we're very familiar with, but as we build these systems that are deployed across the planet, it's important to also think about the social responsibility aspect and how to build that into our system from day one. So notions of safety, privacy, fairness, inclusion, governance, sustainability, transparency and control, all of these are things that we need to think about. It wasn't obvious when we started building AI systems um, 10 or 20 years ago that were always staying in the lab. But as these systems get really widespread in society, it's absolutely crucial. There's a deep culture of open science and reproducibility. So for those of you who are interested, all the work that I discussed today is actually freely available on um, websites like Archive, as well as many journals and conferences. There's a strong culture of submitting code and so for many of the system that I described, actually you can go download the code on GitHub, play with it yourself. There's also some great tools for reproducibility that allows you to sort of encapsulate together the code, the data, the scripts and so on. Um, so that's quite encouraging. There's really a move towards democratizing access to these models. And when we're more transparent about our work, it enables reproducibility. It makes that everyone can understand and assess the impact and the quality of the models that we produce. With that, I'll just conclude that, you know, part of the journey for me and, and perhaps for some of you has been to always keep a very close loop between research and between practice. We can't afford to let these two diverge too much, really. The research has to be grounded into the practical problems that we want to solve, and the practice has to be informed by the latest state-of-the-art research. So as you progress in your own career, as you discover AI, try to keep that, uh, that in mind. Um, I do think it's really important. I will conclude at this point um, and open it up for questions. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Pinot, for that wonderful talk. I think definitely, um, as you said at the very end, especially as many of the people here are students who are looking forward to sort of get into the field or explore their uh, potential career, right? I think that's definitely really important to consider. And uh, I think, yeah, definitely, we're going to open up for a Q&A now. Thank you for the wonderful talk, uh, Dr. Pinot. Um, and I think definitely we have 
a lot of questions um, here on Slido. So I'm going to go ahead and ask the first one. So um, we have someone asking, uh, is self-supervised learning similar to Adobe Photoshop with its content repair tool, which fills in sections? Is this different from what Dolly is doing? Ah, so I haven't used the Adobe tools, so it, it'd be a little presumptuous for me to, to answer what it's actually doing right now. Is that what it should be doing? Probably yes. And, and I suspect Adobe has a good research group, so I suspect that they're using some of these tools from self-supervised learning to build up the representation of the model. DALI is also doing that. If you saw with DALI, right, you get a, a sentence in. So there's like, you know, we saw the sentence um, about uh, about the putting in the, for the, and then we saw the image. There's both a representation of the, the text that's built from self-supervised learning and then from the image also. Um, so yeah, these are the techniques that seem to be really performing well. There's different variants on it, whether it's, you know, there's, there's different flavors of it that I didn't go into today. So from one model to another, it may change exactly how it's doing some of this work. One of the more recent techniques some of you may have heard is sort of the stable diffusion technique, which is a little bit of a different process for doing it. Some people are not actually calling it self-supervised learning. It sort of fills in the information a little bit differently in terms of interpolation. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks for that response. Uh, it might've been a bit difficult as, uh, as you mentioned, uh, because uh, you don't really have any personal experience with uh, Photoshop. Uh, so to say. Uh, another question that we have is, uh, so you mentioned how the 2D image generation models uh, from 2015 until modern models like Dall e uh, have improved drastically. Uh, what are the main sources uh, of improvements in the techniques used, the learning techniques used? And uh, what do you think uh, will be the challenges to scale uh, image generation for 3D uh, objects? Yeah, there's been some changes in the models themselves in terms of how we train them, but but a big factor has been the size of the data sets, to be honest. And, and as we train on, on larger and larger data sets, in particular on the language side. So one of the things that I'll, and, and some of these similar models do much better is actually understand the sentence that's being provided and, and build a representation for that. You may have heard of other models like GPT-3, for example, that are able to sort of understand text and generate the continuation of text. So we understand the, the, the language better. So we have a better sense of what we want, uh, but the size of the data set has been really quite a big factor. So that's, that's a bit the challenge. Um, all of this is, is or in large part in, uh, internet acquired data. We don't have that for 3D. Um, so one of the big uh, one of the big push is to try to reconstruct three D objects from two D images. So if we had a good model that can go from two D to three D, let's say we're able to take all of our two D images and turn them into three D representation, then that would be a lot easier to do some of these things in three D. So that's one of the things on which researchers are working. Gotcha, definitely. I think. Oh, sorry. Uh, were you going to say something else? I was going to add, and, and, you know, I've shown it mostly in the case of objects, like everyday objects. But actually, if you think about it for medical imaging, there's a lot of these same questions, right? Like the, the tumor segmentation or some of the COVID detection that we've done was all done in 2D images. But the human body, of course, is, in, is a three-dimensional object. And more than that, it's a 3D deformable object which actually, you know, the organs move around and there's fluids and all these things which make it more complicated. So there's a lot of challenges there also to move to 3D that are really quite interesting. Definitely, because especially since not everything's gonna be the same as it was on paper, because some things will constantly change in their different variables. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of uh, variables. Um, so the next question is actually, how are mathematical equations on regression and gradient descent actually connected to neural networking and ML? And what do some of the variables represent? Mm. So for, for those of you who are familiar with, with regression, usually you try to train a particular function, let's say a, a line, and you're trying to pick out a line that best matches a set of points. 
Um, in that case, you can find the coefficients of that line through, in some cases, through sort of a closed form solution using algebra. But you can also find the coefficient of that line through gradient descent, meaning you like pick a line and you see how well it accommodates the nearby point and you move it a little bit and you move it a little bit and you move it a little bit till it gets close to the point that you've seen in your data. And so the gradient descent algorithm can be used for regression, um, but it's not always the best solution for regression. Now, in neural network, you're essentially doing regression, but because you have so many of these neurons and inside each of these neurons, there's a little function that's typically nonlinear. And so to optimize those weights, you need to use an algorithm called backpropagation that actually does that, um, does that action of adjusting the weights in a way that, that leads to prediction, you know, to, be, to being a, a good prediction machine. It's a little bit hard to explain without sort of a you know, whiteboard and, and some, some drawing around, um, but there's a lot of great lectures on the, on the web about uh, gradient descent methods and regression. And, and if you want suggestions of good speakers for future events, I'm happy to also suggest a few people who could go deeper into that topic. Well, thanks a lot for that response. Um, so another question that we received that is uh, sort of related to what you uh, talked about uh, two questions ago uh, about 3D objects and images. So you've mentioned that there is a lack of 3D images, but uh, there are videos online on uh, platforms uh, such as YouTube or uh, streaming services. Aren't real world uh, videos uh, that are filmed in just everyday life, uh, good training material for objects and generating objects? Yeah, that's an interesting one. It's a different kind of 3D. So when I talk about 3D, I mean that I have the coordinates of the full shape of the object in X, Y, Z space. When we see videos, it's a sequence of frames. So each of these frames is 2D, but because you have that stacking of the frames, you can represent it in this three-dimensional matrix. So both of them can be, in fact, thought of as 3D object, but, but the nature of that third dimension is quite different. I would say those are two branches, right? It, but, but building representation from video is perhaps going to help me for 3D object, but only if it means that I get several points of views of the same object. And if I do that, then we're back to having, you know, different 2D slices that can then be used to reconstruct the, the 3D object. But in many cases, uh, depending on the point of view of the video and so on, you don't really get that um, over time. Um, but there's a lot of work, and I didn't talk about it nearly as much today, but there's a lot of work to be done for building representations from video in particular, in images, we're getting very good at doing like the representation across space, like knowing all the pieces of an object, doing this kind of representation across time for long duration is actually still very, very difficult. Um, let's say you just want to do activity recognition in a video. So you have a video of someone playing basketball or someone playing a clarinet or someone riding a bike. We can start to do activity recognition over short uh, videos um, over a long video to have much more complicated concept is really, really still, um, there's still a lot of work to do, to be honest. And it, when we think about generating video, so I give you a few frames and I ask you to generate the next sequence in a way that looks plausible, we still don't have very good models, but I expect that we'll see a lot of progress on video in the next year or two. I think it's actually really interesting, all uh, the different the differentiation you're making between um, just normal 3D everyday videos um, and between sort of uh, that you actually need the X, Y coordinates in order to actually sort of build something off of that. I thought that was really interesting. I didn't know that. Um, yeah. And so another question uh, I wanted to ask, actually, uh, it's, it's a bit zooming out a bit, but so. Um, someone says, thank you for the good presentation. Um, just a quick question. What is the difference between machine learning, um, AI, and deep learning? Mm. So AI is about building cognition in machines. And, and so if you think of human cognition as an example, right, there's, you know, we, learning is a big part of human cognition, but a part is forming memory. 
a part is planning, a part is reasoning. There's all these other tasks, you know, judgment and so on that also are included in AI. So machine learning is the piece of AI that is about actually learning concept. Within machine learning, there's lots of different ways that machine can learn concept. Deep learning is one way to do machine learning. And it's used typically to mean the piece of machine learning that uses neural network and that use very large neural network that can build a representation. So not just kind of a regression function, but actually a network that's large enough to learn many complicated concepts. So AI, machine learning, deep learning. Yeah, thank you for that explanation. I think that's, uh, since our audience is very young and we have a lot of people trying to get into this field of artificial intelligence and uh, so there's many confusions uh, between these terms, uh, which we find is quite common. Uh, so another question that we have is about uh, the blue score when evaluating uh, language translations. So mm -hmm. mm, I, I would assume it's very difficult and complex to explain, uh, but Perhaps you could give an overview of how this is calculated and whether there are some general lessons that can be applied elsewhere uh, that are related to this. Yeah, it's actually one that's not that complicated. I won't, you know, I won't write down the, the formula, but it's actually not that complicated. It's used primarily for machine translation. So, you know, I live in Canada. We have a lot of people speaking French and English. And, and so we have some great data sets in particular from the government of Canada where all of the discussions in our house of parliament are produced in two languages, French and English. And so that's actually a data set that's commonly used. Now, if I have a sentence in French and in English, I can train my system to predict the translation. So I'll feed it the sentence in French. It will put out the sentence in English the blue score is the difference between the sentence in English that my AI system produced and the real translation from a human translator. And so it, think of it as the difference between those two sentences. Now there's different ways to calculate the difference um, because the sentences can be different in many ways. If they're exactly the same, then it's easy. But if they're not exactly the same, you can have word being added, you can have words being removed, you can have words being substituted, you can have words being inverted. So the blue score looks at different lengths of the sub sub pieces of the sentence, let's say two, three, four words. And it says over those small pieces of the sentence, what's the similarity and where is it different between the predicted translation and then the human translation. I think also, uh, unfortunately, we are um, a bit over time, um, and it does look like there are a lot more questions on the Slido, um, which is good because it looks like everyone enjoyed this talk. So thank you, Dr. Pino. Um, but I'm wondering, um, would there be any way for us to sort of uh, compile the rest of the remaining questions in a document and then send it to you afterwards? Um, just so that people who could need their questions answered can still get them answered, even though we're ending the webinar for today? I'll do my best to answer them, yes. Okay, sounds like a plan. Um, I, I really appreciate it because I know you're already taking time out of your day to join us. So um, I'm definitely. happy to be here. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I think there, I know there are lots of questions left on the Slido, so um, we will post them with the webinar transcript. Um, but I will, I did want to ask one last question um, before we close is since we have a lot of high schoolers um, or just students who are looking to get into artificial intelligence on our Zoom, I'm wondering what would be your advice to a high schooler who is trying to get into artificial intelligence? How can they get started? What is wonderful today, I think, is there's so many different paths into the field. Traditionally, it was really through an education in computer science or engineering or math. Those were really kind of the typical ways. And these are still always really great ways to get into AI, starting with a great education. I, I have to say, I have a maybe a, a slight bias towards students who do like CS and math together. I find like that's a great preparation for, for doing an AI. But, you know, I, I was an engineering undergrad. I started building robots before, you know, the physical sensors before I even thought of, you know, what they should be computing. I have students who came more from a linguistic side, an economic side, 
I, I so I think there's a lot of different paths into it, but typically I would say CS math engineering, sometimes physics are sort of the more the more common one, but we will need over time a lot of people to, you know, have studied philosophy, sociology, um, all these other fields, law, ethics, to really build AI systems that are complete and that bring value to society. Definitely. I think the really amazing thing about AI is that it's such a broad field. So there are so many different ways that one can get into AI from so many different fields. Like you could be interested in agriculture, you could be interested yeah. in forensics, right? There's so many different ways. And um, actually you don't even need to, um, if you're more interested in the application side um, and don't necessarily uh, think you uh, feel like you're more pr prone to coding, I think definitely there are also other ways for you as well. Um, so definitely it's a lot of great room for this field. Um, but definitely, um, also, I just wanted to send the Discord links, the Discord server to everyone again. Um, it will be in the chat for people who want to keep up to date for uh, our next UTI Lab talk in October. Um, and also, of course, we'll post announcements there and we'll notify people once the transcript is out. Um, so definitely, everyone, uh, thank you again, Dr. Pernod, for the fantastic talk. Um, and thank you, everyone, for uh, coming today to listen to um, Dr. DePano's talk regarding AI research in the metaverse. Um, we'll answer your questions afterwards in the transcript. Um, thank you, Dr. Pano, for also taking extra time to uh, offer um, and do that. Uh, thank you for coming, everyone. And uh, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day, wherever you are. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. And thank you again, Dr. Pernod.